Thank you, Rob. Uh, yeah, so thank you to all the organizers for keeping this going during the apocalypse. And uh, thank you for inviting me to speak as well. So today I'm going to talk about, or I'm going to, in some sense, introduce this framework that we've developed for what we call space-time block preconditioning. And there's kind of two background motivations for what we're doing here. One of them is that I, I think it would be beneficial to solve transition parallel in time where we treat time and space separately to solving things in more of an all at once or space time fashion. So in some sense, we treat time as a spatial derivative. And I'll talk a little bit more about why I think that's uh, a good thing to think about. And part two is also we want to solve, I think that we should think about solving systems of PDs and, and more complex physical problems. Um, and diffusion is interesting and it's a great model problem and development problem, but we want to look at problems for parallel time that have long time dynamics, because that's really where parallel time makes sense. If you have to simulate something for a very long time, that parallelization becomes important. Uh, and, and diffusion doesn't typically have that kind of long term dynamics. So I want to say for systems of PDs that might have nonlinear coupling and, and evolve over a very long time period, how do we do this in all at once fashion? And so this is joint work primarily with uh, Fede Daniele, who's a PhD student at Oxford, uh, and then his advisor, Andy Wathen. And I just want to point out that Fede's done a really nice job getting into the, the weeds and, and doing some of the, the hard work on implementation and, and testing some of these ideas. And then some of the side work I'll talk about was with Sonder and Abula at University of Waterloo. So, okay, so I'm going to start with a background on block preconditioning and kind of further motivation on how we why I think we should use this and how we can extend it to the space-time setting. And then I'm gonna talk about applying it in, in two kind of successively harder problems. First, incompressible Navier-Stokes, and then incompressible resistive MHD. And, and what we're gonna do is take principles that have been used in the sequential setting uh, and apply them to the space-time setting. So I'm gonna start off with kind of three claims that motivate this work. And they're not, they're not always true, but I think they're good principles to think about. And so the first one is that space-time or all-at-once methods, again, where we treat the time as just in some sense in our spatial derivative, I think there's a lot of benefit to be had in the parallel time and the general uh, solver sense using this. And in particular, I think by treating time as a spatial variable, we can build solvers, all-at-once solvers with a lower overhead computational cost than if you treat time separately than space. And, to me, a simple way to think about this or, or a kind of motivating way is if we just take Laplacian, forget time, uh, we never solve this separately in X and Y, right? You, you wouldn't do that. You solve X and Y together in a uniform manner and that's how we get good solvers. And in principle, that's what I think we wanna do in time, space time as well. We wanna treat time with this kind of full coupled system. And there's also benefits too. We can naturally incorporate features like space time AMR, time dependent domains, et cetera. Uh, and this is not unique to the all at once approach. As Rob mentioned earlier, you can do this in sequential time setting, but I think there's a lot of features like this that are just more natural if you consider things all at once. Um, you can also use space time fine elements, which we've seen several talks about today. They have lots of nice properties, uh, some of which we saw earlier. And what I'm going to comment on specifically is that you can naturally get high order accuracy on index two DAEs like Navier Stokes, which which is actually not trivial if you're doing sequential time stepping. Uh, Dirk methods and a lot of the standard techniques don't give you high order accuracy on your algebraic constraint, but, but fine elements do. So the second claim I wanna make is that effective parallel time or space time kind of methods are going to require multi-level techniques. And again, this is not completely true, but I think it's a good principle to think about that we wanna use multi-level principles in our solvers. Uh, most parallel time methods, not all, most, uh, as well as most fast implicit PD solvers, taste as always, use some kind of multi level principles. And there's the obvious ones like multi grid, algebraic multi grid, or geometric uh, multi level methods, and multi pole method. Um, and they all, they're all different in some sense, but they use some kind of multi level hierarchy to accelerate things. And on kind of a converse note, parallel multi-level methods and emphasizing the parallel uh, can be difficult for highly effective problems and systems of PDEs. And again, there's been methods that have been developed that are effective on each of these. We, uh, I, I worked on highly effective problems for quite a while with algebraic multigrid. There's been lots of good geometric multigrid systems of PDEs, but you kind of need to have specialized methods that can handle systems or evection or, or 
especially if you want to go to high order unstructured meshes, there's additional problems or difficulties for geom geometric multigrid. And so what I'm getting at here is that if we want to solve space-time systems of PDEs, there's a lot of stuff going on. And I don't know that we're currently in a position where doing a geometric multigrid on the whole space-time system uh, is, is super tractable. And I, I might be wrong. Uh, there's still some talks coming up that could, that could talk about this, but it, it's at the le very least challenging. And so this, this kind of motivates my third claim is that I think that all at once solvers are much more tractable for single variable PDEs. And uh, we've seen that today. We've seen some very nice results on a space-time multi-grid-like idea for diffusion that's very, very scalable. And so the motivation of this work is, okay, suppose we have good solvers for a single variable space-time system PDEs all at once. How can we extend this to systems of PDEs? Uh, and, and so diffusion is what a lot of the works have looked at. Geometric multi-grid uh, in space-time for diffusion or this kind of waveform multi-grid I also just want to highlight, we've had some good results on algebraic multigrid for advection dominated problems. So here, if we take our advection diffusion equation and we just consider the partial T as a part of the grad hat here, then we can write this as a steady state problem in some sense in D plus one dimensions. And so this is just an example problem we solved where we have a time dependent domain. We use space time fine elements. So in time going up, the domain is moving when we have this Gaussian pulse that is recirculating around the domain. And so what we did is we applied our non-symmetric AMG method that I developed with colleagues during my thesis. Uh, and we used BICG stab as a wrapper and a space-time HDG. So this is hybridizable discontinuous Galerkin, a certain variation on DG methods. Uh, it's a relative residual 10 to the minus 12. And so what we see in the tables is we have order P, so P equals one, two, and three. And this is our diffusion coefficient nu. And so the whole left half of these tables is going to be real advection dominated problems. And, and the principle here is that we know air works well on steady state advection. So if you think about time as just another advective derivative, it should be a similar problem in the advection dominated regime. And indeed, we see that we get very scalable results in space and more or less in fine element order too, in the whole left half of these plots where we have advection dominated problems. When we start to get more into the diffusive regime, air does not work as well. And this is potentially where we can apply the more geometric approaches uh, that lots of different people have developed, including some of the talks today. Uh, and I also want to point out that discretization is important, the, the, the spatial and space-time discretization. If we switch to EDG, which is a different kind of discontinuous Galerkin that enforces a certain level of continuity uh, between elements, then here we get much better scalability in the, in the diffusive parameter. So as now as we get over the diffusion regime, we're you know, 12 iterations, 10 last 12 relative residual, which is really quite good. Uh, and again, pretty good up to P123. So all this is saying is that between other work on geometric multigrid, our work on non-symmetric AMG, I think it's quite tractable to have good, fast, scalable, all at once solvers for single variable PDEs. So this raises the question, well, how can we develop space-time solvers for systems of PDEs? And to answer that, I want to step back and say, okay, well, what do people use for sequential time stepping? Obviously there's geometric multigrid, but that, that's, problem specific and requires specific smoothers and meshes and discretizations, all that stuff. So what other techniques do people use? And we talk about block reconditioning. This is a standard alternative to multigrid. And a good example of this is applied to incompressible Navier-Stokes. And this is the incompressible Navier-Stokes or equation uh, in kind of its full glory uh, with, you know, dependence on, on spatial points and time. Uh, U is our velocity field, so this is going to be a vector variable, and then P is our pressure, and we have this divergence-free constraint on our velocity field. And so I, I always think it's easier to see this equation in uh, kind of a linear algebra form. And so if we if we disregard boundary conditions for now, we can write the system in this kind of pseudo-linear form, where we have a nonlinear dependence on U in our velocity field, but otherwise we have this kind of block two by two operator. And of course, if we had Stokes or Ocene, then this U would either be linear via U hat, or it would just go away for Stokes and we have a two by two linear operator. And so in any case, if we have Stokes or Ocene or a linearization of your Stokes, each of those is gonna fall into the class of, of two by two block operators that we need to solve. And so it'll look something like this, A11, A12, A21, A22. And depending on discretization, A22 might be zero, it might not, uh, but, but that's fine. 
And so black preconditioning approximates the solution of this using some kind of sure complement preconditioner. And so a, a standard approach is use a block triangular preconditioner. Uh, here we use upper triangular because we're going to use right preconditioning later in our uh, presentation. But left is fine. You can probably use lower triangular for left or diagonal or block L to U. And so what we do is we invert A11. So we invert our leading block or, or approximately invert it. We typically don't do the full inverse every iteration. And then we have this S hat where S hat approximates our sure complement in the 2 2 block. And so this is the sure complement. And the tricky thing with the sure complement is we have this A11 inverse in here. So for Navier Stokes, for Stokes, A1 inverse is going to be a, a diffusion or advection diffusion kind of problem. And then we have this inverse. And so we can't form the sure complement directly. Uh, and we don't even really want to iterate on it because it applies, it requires this exact inverse. But we need some kind of approximation. If we can develop this approximation, and we can solve it, then we've kind of moved the system coupling out of our inner solves to this outer block preconditioning framework where we, where we can apply whatever kind of solver we want, multigrid, algebraic, multigrid, uh, to A11 and to our S hat. And then the coupling is handled again by this block preconditioning. And so I, I just want to include a theorem that we recently proved. And so sure components have long been known to be kind of a driving factor behind convergence of uh, block preconditioning. And we formalized this a little bit more recently, where if you look at fixed point and minimal residual methods uh, for two by two block operators, and you precondition with some kind of two by two block triangular, Jacobi, LDU preconditioner, or some approximate sure complement, this is going to converge to some tolerance C times rho in norm, and this is important, uh, after n iterations, if and only if an equivalent of method applied to the preconditioned sure complement converges tolerance rho after n iterations. And so the, the point is that in norm to uh, a non-zero tolerance, your convergence is still really defined by how well you precondition the sure complement. And so in some sense, we've decomposed, again, solving this two by two system into A11 and, and our sure complement S. And, and it's, not, it's not a true reduction because S depends on A11, but again, we can apply individual solvers that don't have system structure uh, to A11 and S. And that's the idea here. So we can use single variable solvers to these. We can solve our coupled system. And, and that's, as far as I've heard, uh, a part of what developed early work in block recognition for Stokes and Navier Stokes was because multi grid on these systems was hard and, and, and required special kind of smoothers and, and discretizations and whatnot. So going back to Navier Stokes, what do we do in the spatial or sequential time stepping setting? We replace our partial T with a one over DT. So this is like a time step. And so our sure complement in a strong form where we're just thinking about differential operators uh, takes this form here. So we have the, the divergence, negative divergence of this vector advection diffusion inverse. So this is our, our velocity field, remember, times a gradient. And so a, a very common principle in block preconditioning is to assume some kind of commutation. And so what we're gonna assume is we're gonna say, if we take our advection diffusion equation right here on the velocity space times the gradient, we're going to assume that we can bring that gradient through this operator to the left. And so this is approximately equal to the gradient of an equivalent advection diffusion equation defined on the pressure space. And, and again, because this is a scalar variable, that's where this commutation uh, ends up coming in. And so if, if we look at this and rearrange, we apply some inverses to both sides and multiply by that divergence, then this, this first line implies this second assumption here, which is that if we take the negative divergence of this advection diffusion inverse on the velocity space times the gradient, and notice this is exactly our sure complement right here, that this is approximately equal to a div grad on the pressure space. So this is a pressure of Plotian. And then an advection diffusion inverse also on the pressure space. So we, we've kind of eliminated the velocity space from our sure complement, and now we're working only on the smaller pressure space. And so based on this approximation, this is where we define our approximate sure complement. We call S hat uh, as exactly this right here. So we have our pressure Laplacian and this advection diffusion equation inverse. When we invert, we have to have a mat vec by the advection diffusion equation of pressure space, and we have to solve a pressure Laplacian. And so again, if, if going back to the systems versus the single variable PDEs, when we do a preconditioning, we now have to invert the leading advection diffusion equation and then we have to invert S hat, which just requires involving or inverting a pressure of washing. And, and both of these can be handled with very standard multigrid or algebraic multigrid kind of techniques. So the, the space-time question is in space-time block preconditioning, can we 
precondition a full space-time system of PDEs using similar principles where we only have to solve space-time single variable PDEs and some approximate sure complements that are also single variable in some sense? And, and the answer is yes, and that's what I'm gonna get into. And to see this on a high level, let's go back to our approximate commutator framework and think about the space-time setting. If we include this partial T right here, uh, the time derivative, rather than replacing it with the time step, we can see that this assumption is still very similar. It's, it's almost the same. It's gonna hold on an infinite dimensional domain with no boundary conditions because derivatives naturally commute. And the time derivative is no different. The time derivative is also gonna commute with these spatial derivatives. And so it's uh, a similar and natural assumption to make is to just include the time derivative here. Uh, and, and in the rest of the talk, what I'm gonna do is make kind of a stronger direct connection between the spatial assumption and how we can actually in a discrete sense, directly extend this to the space-time set. But, but this is the basic principle on a, on a high level. And I also wanna point out that we can naturally apply this framework to space-time fine elements. We haven't done that in this talk. We started with simpler discretizations to you know, develop the framework and, and understand the ideas. But in principle, we can apply the space-time fine elements too and, and realize a lot of the benefits there. And that's you know ongoing slash future work. Okay, so, so that's the idea. And now I'm gonna move into actually looking at space-time block preconditioning for incompressible Navier-Stokes. So I showed the Navier-Stokes equations earlier. And here I just wanna talk about this rotation a little bit in the form that it takes. So we're gonna use backward Euler in time, fully implicit, relatively simple discretization, but, but it's a, a good problem or a good uh, integrator to, to develop this on and test it. And we use H1 in space. So Taylor Hood, P2, P1. So, so P2 on velocity and P1 on pressure. And once we linearize, we're gonna call F, script FU, uh, this vector advection diffusion equation, just for ease of notation, where U hats are linearized uh, advection or velocity field. And B transpose from ER gradient and script B is ER divergence. And so then if we write out the, the full space-time system for backward Euler, then we get the kind of standard bi-diagonal system that everybody here or most people are probably familiar with that takes this form. And, and the only difference here is that because our pressure variable P is uh, not time dependent, it's an algebraic constraint, in the subdiagonal, we only have this M over DT on the velocity block. So we have an M over DT and then zero, 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 because this variable is not time dependent. And so the trick here when we look at this and to move this to more of a block preconditioning context is to reorder it. So right now we order things by time step, right? But we can also think about ordering this by variable and put it in more of a block, a block structured system. And when we do that, our space-time system now takes this form, which you might notice looks a lot like it did for the steady state. It's the saddle point where we have this zero down in the lower block. Uh, we have a blocked diagonal of gradient and divergence operators for each time step. And now our velocity block has transitioned from being just advection diffusion to being a space-time advection diffusion. Uh, but otherwise, we have very much the same principles. And so then if we want to solve this in a precondition kind of manner, the space-time matrix A, what we can think about is solving or approximately solving FU inverse. So that's the space-time advection diffusion equation. And we need to approximate the sure complement. And in this case, the sure complement will be minus B FU inverse B transpose, where again, B and B transpose are block diagonals of the gradient and divergence. And then FU inverse is this space-time advection diffusion equation. So the question becomes, how do we precondition this and can we apply similar approximate commutator assumptions to do that? And so to look at this closer, uh, I wanna formalize a little bit in the fine element setting, what our spatial commutation assumption was. And so it, it's really the same as it was when I showed the, the strong form with the differential operators, um, but we now have some mass matrices. So remember, this is our advection diffusion equation on the velocity space times our gradient is approximately equal to our gradient times advection diffusion on the pressure space. So remember, that's exactly what we had a few slides ago, but now we just have some extra mass, extra mass matrices included in here, MP being on the pressure space and MU being on the velocity space. And so note that FU, right, that's this uh, FU being the full space-time advection diffusion equation. This is backward Euler, uh, blocked by a diagonal, and we know what FU inverse looks like. Right? It has the block lower triangular structure. Lots of people have seen it in parallel and time literature. So we can write FU inverse explicitly in this block lower triangular form. And it ends up being powers of, of FU inverse and the mass matrix MU. Uh, and depending on your, your time point too, if, uh, if you have a time dependent velocity field. 
And so to form the Schur complement, we take this FU inverse and we multiply on the left and the right by our block diagonal divergence from gradient operators. And without getting too into the details, the, the key observation is that when you do that, all of the inner operators, so all of the blocks of the Schur complement, take this form. And it's, it's very similar to what we see in the spatial setting or sequential setting. We have this divergence on the left and gradient on the right. And instead of just one advection diffusion inverse on the side and the inside, we have a product of a bunch of them. And so how do we approximate this? We can use the same approach as we do for sequential time stepping recursively. And so going back to our, our fine element spatial commutation, uh, it can be rewritten in this form. And this is the second uh, version I showed in the strong form. So now we have our advection diffusion inverse on the velocity space times the gradient is approximately equal to the gradient times our advection diffusion pressure inverse. And again, we just added some mass matrices here. And so if we take this approximation, this assumption right here, and we multiply on, on both sides on the left by an FU J plus I inverse, uh, MU over delta T or J plus one really to start, and we do this recursively, then we can get some nice kind of recursive approximation. So on the left, this is simple. We take right here, multiply on the left by this, we get exactly what we expect. On the right, this MU and MU inverse are gonna cancel. And so instead we have this FU J plus one inverse times our B transpose. That ends up being the leading term. And what we can notice is if you look at this, this is exactly the same form as the left-hand side of our assumption. So with an extra J plus one index. So we recursively plug this assumption into here where we have an MU inverse B transpose, now FP inverse on the pressure place, J plus one, MP. And so we repeat this until a certain index is satisfied depending on which block you are in the matrix. And then you left multiply by that divergence, which is B. And we have the space-time equivalent of our fine element commutation assumption for Navier-Stokes. And it's that when we take the inside block of our space-time sure complement, we have a divergence and a gradient and all these inverses. Now in the velocity space, we pull this gradient through. So we have a, a, a div grad that's on the pressure space. And this, this mass matrix on U inverse, this is approximated in your pressure Laplace, And this is exactly as is done in the sequential setting. And then we have a bunch of products of inverses now defined only on the pressure space. And if we plug all these pieces in, uh, into our space-time Schur complement, minus BF inverse B transpose, then we form our new Schur complement approximation. So it's this S hat. We have a block diagonal of uh, more or less div grad. This is a pressure Laplacian, and this is what's approximated and, and using standard techniques from sequential time stepping. We have this big lower triangular operator now defined in the pressure space, and then a bunch of pressure, pressure mass matrices. And so if you look at this closely, you may notice it's the same form as we had earlier. And in fact, it's exactly the inverse of a pressure space-time advection diffusion equation. And so this is how we define our approximate short complement in the space-time setting. We say this is approximately equal to AP. So where AP is, again, our pressure Laplacian that almost represents this to spectral equivalence. Uh, we have FP inverse, where non-script FP is going to be the space-time advection diffusion equation on the pressure space, and we have MP being a, a block diagonal of mass matrices. So putting it together for like the whole picture, uh, we define our space-time block preconditioner. We approximate our space-time inverse, A, with this P inverse, where we have a triangular approximation, including FU and our approximate sure complement in the lower right. And again, we're doing an upward triangular because we're going to do right preconditioning, uh, but that, that's not so important. And so to do this, to apply this operator, we have to solve the approximate sure complement each iteration, which requires a pressure mass matrix at each step inverse. We do a mat vec by a space-time advection diffusion equation, and then we solve the pressure of Laplacian at each time point. And so this is this is all very easy to do in parallel. The only thing that's not completely parallel uh, is, is applying this mat vec because it's going to have coupling. But overall, this is very parallel and can be done with standard uh, existing spatial kind of solvers. And then we have to apply the off diagonal gradient operator each time step. Again, trivial, easy to do at each time step, totally, fully independent. And the last piece is to approximately solve our space-time advection diffusion equation, this FU inverse. And so this 
uh, is what I was referring to earlier that I think we can use a lot of the currently being developed uh, solvers for space-time diffusion, space-time convection diffusion, stuff like that to apply this in a, a fast way. And we really only need an approximate inverse to it uh, to iterate in our larger block preconditioning. So for some numeric results, again, this is just a simple block representation of our equation. We implemented this solver structure in MFEM, uh, fine element library based out of Livermore and Hyper and Petsy. And we use two different things. We, we use sequential time stepping for the inner solver uh, to apply FU inverse for some of the tests, really to test how accurate the outer block preconditioning is, right? So it's like claiming if we have a good solver for FU, how effective is our block preconditioning? And then we also apply uh, the non-symmetric AMG method, AIR, that I mentioned earlier, to solve the inner space-time velocity equation too, to see if we can really apply some kind of approximation and still get good results. And so we picked four fairly standard test problems in, in fluids. They're not you know, real challenging industry problems, but they're, they're good models to make sure our, our principles are working and the method, method does indeed work as we expect it to. And uh, we have a, a lid-driven cavity, a proceedly flow, a double glazing problem, and the backward-facing step. And uh, the, the lid-driven cavity and backward-facing step are the ones that are actually Navier-Stokes equations uh, that are nonlinear. The double glazing, <clears throat> we, uh, uh, we define a velocity field in advance, so it's more of an OCene. There's no nonlinear aspect in the proceedly flow, I believe, we treat as Stokes. And so just to start, we do some eigenvalue clustering to show that, you know, we get overall good eigenvalue clusters, uh, as we expect. And eigenvalues are not, not the best measure of convergence, in my opinion, for space-time settings, because if you just take a block diagonal preconditioner of the lower bi-diagonal operator, you can get perfect eigenvalue preconditioning. But when we reorder, it's a little bit different. And so here we see for P4, for our double glazing problem, once we linearize, um, oh no, I'm sorry, that one's hard to linear, that's a scene. Uh, we see pretty good clustering, especially for smaller pick layer or, or Reynolds numbers, really. We haven't coupled anything. And when we get to larger pick layer, 100, then we see the eigenvalues start to spread out in the imaginary axis. And, and this is overall quite consistent with what you get in the spatial and sequential setting as well. Uh, what we've done here is an extension of what's called PCD preconditioning to the space time setting. And PCD is also not, oh, not really robust uh, in terms of high Peckley numbers. But what I just want to highlight is that we knew that in advance. If we wanted to solve high Peckley numbers, we could use other principles that have been developed for sequential time stepping and try to extend them to the high Peckley, high Reynolds uh, space time setting as well. And so I'm just going to show iterations to convergence. This is using an exact sequential inner solver for the space time velocity block. And this is for P1, uh, problem number one. And on the left, we fix delta t, and then we modify delta x from 2 to minus 2 to minus 8. On the right, we fill it fix delta x, and then modify delta t from 2 to minus 7 to minus 1. And so what we see is, like, on the right, we're pretty invariant time step size, which is, in my opinion, an important measure of robustness. We fix delta x, and we can take big time steps, we can take small time steps that our works, we get very nice convergence, and we get, you know, in 7, 15, 16, 17 iterations, reading 10 to the minus 10 relative residual. So we're converging very, very fast uh, and, and invariant time step size. On the left, we see similar behavior. Uh, the results are a little more spread out. And to me, as a multi this is actually interesting. What you might notice is that for big delta X, uh, we actually take longer. And as delta X gets smaller and smaller, then the iterations actually improve. We converge faster for a bigger problem. And as a multi this was a bit surprising to me because typically I think of problems getting harder as delta X gets smaller and your problem gets bigger. Uh, for block preconditioning, our assumption makes the most sense in the infinite dimensional continuous setting. And so what happens with this approximate commutation is that as your mesh gets smaller and smaller, you approximate the continuous problem better, your assumption gets better, and you actually converge better. Uh, which to me is, is an interesting phenomenon. But so here on the finest mesh, uh, we get very nice convergence again, 15, 16 iterations, 10 to minus 10 relative residual. And so those are my, my plots. I have a few tables too. I don't love tables, but they can show a lot more data at once. Uh, so here again, we have GM residuals 10 minus 10 relative residual. We have kind of medium Peckley number of 10 
And on the left, we show the exact inner solves using sequential time stepping. And on the right, we use 15 air iterations to approximate the space time velocity. Uh, and, and I just also want to point out that this does not end up being an exact solve. You might wonder from the original plot I showed on the HDG method, using H1 basis functions and this more diffusion dominated regime, this is, is overall fairly approximate. And so these problems are between 500 and 700 million degrees of freedom on the largest size. Uh, and so what we see, again, like the plots, we see very nice uh, scalability in both in and outside the parentheses going down the diagonals where we fix the delta T delta X ratio, we actually get better 16 iterations. And for the most part, air does a really nice job as an approximate inner solver. Oops, sorry. Uh, there's a few problems like right here where air is not doing great, but overall in most cases, uh, a handful of inner air iterations are enough to approximate the full sequential time stepping and get the same number of outer iterations to convergence. And so this is problem one and problem two, very similar results on problem three and problem four. Again, uh, between 20 and 30 total outer iterations, pretty comparable between air and sequential time stepping. The only caveat is these X's right here, but that's just because we ran out of memory uh, with our Krylov space and 700 million degrees of freedom. And so when we're thinking about space-time methods, and one of the original motivations of this topic was the overhead cost. So like we want to minimize this overhead cost. And so to think about the block reconditioning, the overhead cost, I make the assumption that, okay, suppose that we can solve the space-time advection diffusion equation in a comparable amount of iterations or, or wall clock time as it would take to solve sequential time stepping the... Uh, advection diffusion equation. And so I think this is actually quite reasonable, especially given the talk earlier where they were using PCG and getting near perfect scalability on a space time system. So if it takes the same amount of time to solve our space time velocity or space time velocity equation, then the only overhead cost is the ratio of the outer block reconditioning iterations from the space time setting versus what would be used in the sequential setting. Uh, and so here we take that ratio for our three different problems, or our, excuse me, our four different problems, uh, and three different delta x and three from delta t. And the overhead and iteration cost is, is quite small. So it usually only takes between one and two times more iterations if we do the space time block reconditioning as opposed to just the spatial block reconditioning with sequential time stepping. So we have to work a little bit harder, but really not very much. And this is the kind of overhead that I think can be overcome pretty quickly as we increase the number of processors and, and things stagnate in the sequential setting. And so last, it's just important to, to point out that we can also, we can solve the nonlinear problem. There's no issues there. Uh, this is a count of nonlinear iterations. Again, we use Picard uh, as our nonlinear solver, which for the lower Reynolds Peckway number regime works just fine. If we got into real high, high Reynolds number, we'd have to be a little fancier with the nonlinear iteration. But here we get three, four, five nonlinear iterations, which is overall very consistent with, uh, with the steady state, or excuse me, steady state or sequential time stepping setting. And again, the X is just mean we ran out of memory. Okay, so that was Navier Stokes. And overall, we were very happy with those results. We thought that uh, they look quite good. We're scalable in space, scalable in time, very low iteration counts, uh, and has a lot of potential. And so moving forward, we want to look at that using space time fine elements and some more maybe modern or, or, or accurate discretizations uh, and, and look at the AMR aspect. But another thing we wanted to study is okay, well, we applied this Navier Stokes. Can we also apply this framework to other problems where we look at block preconditioning in the sequential time stepping setting? And so a natural next step was to say, okay, well, what about uh, MHD equations? They're in some sense an extension of Navier-Stokes because you're going to have Navier-Stokes equations in them and then you start coupling to other terms as well. And so here's our model. Uh, it's a certain kind of uh, reduced not technically reduced, reduced MHD is a very specific class of problems, but uh, uh, an MHD model that's been simplified based on certain assumptions of 2D space and appealing to Ampere's and Ohm's law. Uh, and so this is our full set of four equations. So we have our velocity pressure, and this is largely the same as Navier-Stokes, but now we have this new coupling to our potential equation. Uh, and so here's J, this is our current, it's actually current magnitude, so it's a scalar variable. And then A is going to be our potential in the Z direction. So more or less orthogonal to our 2D uh, spatial plane where we're integrating. 
And so here again, we use continuous H1 uh, Taylor Hood type fine elements, and we, we actually use a P3, P2 for the velocity pressure space and a P1 for the current intensity and potential. Uh, and this kind of separation ends up being important to get the, to capture the physics accurately. Uh, plasma can be pretty sensitive to getting the right discretization that captures, captures waves and instabilities. And so we had, we kind of motivated this through finite element exterior calculus. Uh, and again, we use backward roller in time for the fully coupled system. And I just want to point out, going back to the very beginning of my talk, plasma is a very good uh, model area to look at parallel and time target problems because it often requires long time domain simulations. And so this is very much of interest in the plasma field community. And so it's a, a good place we can say, well, parallel and time might actually be quite useful if we can get it, you know, working in a scalable manner. And so this is nonlinear in, in, in a few different ways. And so we're going to apply space-time Newton methods. We linearize the whole space-time system. And our Jacobian is going to take this kind of block form right here. And so I wrote it in the top in kind of strong differential form. And we're going to denote all these inner operators uh, with single letters for ease of notation. And so the, the key thing to notice is that this upper left two by two block, this is the navier sox equations that we talked about in the last section. So we have this. This whole part of the operator is in some sense triangular. So if, if, if we can solve this, then this part we can solve immediately. We just have this extra coupling down here in Y. So the question becomes, how do we handle this coupling? And so what we're going to do is we're going to follow the, the sequential approximation that Eric, Eric Sear and his colleagues developed uh, in 2013, I believe where we approximate this Jacobian by introducing an additional term. And, and by doing this, we can now apply factorization where we factor out the Navier-Stokes equations. And so here, our, our Jacobian is approximately equal to this, which is now we have Navier-Stokes, an inverse, which will, when we invert, will then just be a Matbeck. And we have this new coupled system we have to look at. And again, you might notice that now this is actually triangular with this Y coupling. And, what this means is that the only coupling we're going to need to worry about is by this two by two block using the, the first and the last row and column, F, U, Z, Y, and F, A. And so if we do some another factorization of this first matrix, uh, we can actually see where that sure complement pops out. Uh, and it pops out right down here, S, A. This is really the key that we need to invert. So uh, we now have a triangular operator, triangular operator, both easy to invert. Um, we just have to invert this sure complement. This is a sure complement in the potential. Uh, and it takes this form right here. And so again, following Sierra et al., uh, we can say that the sure complement is approximately equal, uh, and it follows a very similar derivation as Navier-Stokes, plus a little bit of uh, physics insight and knowledge, is approximately equal to this FA, which is our space-time advection diffusion equation on the potential equation on the A variable, plus MA, this is just a mass matrix, FA inverse and KA. And KA is effectively a diffusion equation on the potential space. And for small Lundquist, we can actually show that this is relatively well approximated by FA. And we did this in a little bit different context than, than they did in their paper, but they use a similar idea. So we have two different approximations for S hat, either this larger, more complicated operator or just FA. And so I just want to point out that FA is in some sense easy. This is exactly in line with Stokes. This is just a space-time vector diffusion equation. It's single variable, so it's not even, or excuse me, it's scalar, so it's not even a, a vector equation. Uh, and, and we can handle this using existing techniques. This is a little bit more complicated uh, because we have this inverse in here. In Sierra at all, they factor out an MAFA inverse, and they have this inner fourth order operator with, uh, yeah with two powers of FA in one of the terms, because FA has a diffusion equation and ends up being fourth order. They try to solve that directly with AMG. Uh, we are still looking at ways to solve this if we do need this improved approximation, but we haven't reached there yet. Okay, so again, altogether, uh, we make some additional simplifications just to reduce cost. And pretty much we're assuming that, or we're moving to take a block triangular preconditioner instead of block ILU. Then our full space-time preconditioner for the full, fully coupled linearized system takes this form. So it's block triangular, and we have two approximate sure complements. This is exactly what we developed in the Navier-Stokes section, and S hat P is just our, our approximation to the Navier-Stokes sure complement. Uh, and then S A is one of our two approximations in the previous slide to the magnetic sure complement. M is just a mass matrix, and F U is our space-time advection diffusion equation for the velocity variable. 
And so I just want to point out what we're looking at. We haven't done yet, but but if we decide that SA hat needs to be this more compl complicated approximation for a high Lundquist number, uh, which pretty much means that the advection is dominant to the diffusion when you're looking at the, uh, the A potential equation. This is actually the shared complement of this inner two or of this two by two operator. So we can apply the inverse of this guy by applying the inverse of this two by two operator. And I think that there's going to be one more level of recursive sure complement preconditioning to approximate this, which will then approximate this inverse and we'll then plug that into here. But again, we haven't quite made it to that section yet. So that's our preconditioner. And now I'm going to kind of demonstrate some results. Uh, we have two different problems we consider and similar Navier Stokes. These are kind of standard uh, test problems for. MHD, uh, we have the Terry mode and the island coalescence problem. And the island coalescence is when you kind of form this island between uh, two separating areas. And full disclosure, I'm, I'm not a plasma physicist, so probably don't ask me about the, the details of the physics. So I won't have a good answer. But we'll take these kind of two standard model problems. And these are just plots of the current intensity uh, with isolines of the magnetic vector potential, which are effectively the streamlines of the magnetic field in our reduced. Uh, or our, our simplified discretization. And so here we look at scalability, again, similar to the Niver Stokes plots in delta T and delta X uh, for our more complicated SA hat. And this is using exact inner pre or exact sequential time stepping for our space time operator. So we haven't done an approximation here. And again, similar to Niver Stokes, we see very, very nice uh, results. We see scalable in mesh in DCX, excuse me, DX and DT. We have Outer iterations shown on the left, so three to four to five Newton iterations, and we're good. Uh, and then the inner iterations per Newton iteration are shown in parentheses. And so here we have 12, 13, 15, somewhere in there for our inner iterations, which is overall quite, quite small and quite reasonable. And the only catch here is now figuring out a good way to invert this uh, when we're not doing sequential time stepping on the inside. What's interesting is for our model problems here anyway, if we take the simpler approximation of FA, we actually do better. Uh, now our inner iterations are closer to four or five, our inner block preconditioning iteration. So somehow this guy right here is actually causing more harm than good uh, compared with FA. And I think part of this is because we have a small Lindquist number. I think we have Lindquist one or 10 here. So if we crank it up, that might not be the case. This might be important but this is also something we're looking into both in the space time and just the sequential time stepping setting because just choosing the simple FA approximation leads to very, very nice results on these test problems. And again, we're solving Newton to 10 to minus 10 and then each of the inner preconditioned iteration solve 10 to minus two. So it's an, more or less an inexact uh, Newton iteration. Okay, and again, going back to the overhead versus sequential, this is an important measure. I think it's really how uh, we need to think about these new semi all at once kind of methods. So here we show the ratio of Newton iterations to convergence as well as the total number of linear iterations per time step. So this sums over all of our Newton iterations. And overall, we see pretty good. We get a little bit higher down here in the bottom right. Uh, problem two with, with a small DT ends up taking more linear inner iterations. And I just want to comment, this is actually for the for this S hat, we don't have results. This is all very kind of ongoing. We're working on a paper right now. We do not have our ratio uh, table for just this FA. So it might be better, but nonetheless, pretty good. Newton iterations take one and a half to two times more. Not so bad. I think it's probably because we end up being a little bit further away from the basin of Newton convergence when we try to do the whole uh, space time solution at once. Uh, we don't get the initial guess of the previous time step in some sense. Um, and the linear iteration is also not bad. For the most part, they're quite small. So if the Newton is 1.6 and the total linear iteration is 2, means the linear iteration ratio is you know, 1.25 or something. It's quite small. Down here, the linear iteration is closer to 3, so it's a little bit bigger. But again, overall not bad. And an overhead cost of 6 is, I think, something that can be you know, overcome by more processors pretty effectively. And I think the last plot I want to highlight is for longer time domains. Again, as I pointed out, it's important for plasma that we can consider these longer time domains, and especially if that's when some interesting dynamics happens. And so previously we had kind of a unit time interval, t, t final equal one. And so here 
uh, what we change is we, we fix delta t to 0 0.5. So we take a big time step and consider very long time domains of 16, 32, 64, 128, uh, and see how we scale and, and how we're able to solve those problems. And, and overall, we see pretty much perfectly scalable behavior to fixed number of nonlinear iterations, fixed number of interlinear iteration, linear iterations, overall scalable for both problems and any delta x. So those are our two problems. The results look good. Uh, what we're working on, I think there's a lot of stuff to do in this area. Um, block recognition for space-time finite elements, I think, has a lot of potential. And it's something we started looking at. Uh, which finite elements is a very interesting question. I think it's important to pick ones that are both accurate, as we've seen in earlier talks, and also amenable to solvers. And, and making that decision well uh, is, I think, a key point of doing this whole area effectively. Uh, high Reynolds flow or high Lundquist, pretty much more advection-dominated equations. Uh, I'm very interested in that. I generally find advection dominated problems interesting. Uh, and the block recognition techniques end up needing to be a little different typically. Uh, and so that's also an interesting and ongoing question. Um, again, solvers for space time advection diffusion, single variable PDEs. This is kind of the assumption and, and the backbone of this block recognition framework. And so, a very important piece, but I think there's some nice work being done on that. And then, of course, always interested in other applications. Where else can we take this framework and apply it? And I will say, if people are interested in looking at any of these problems with me, I, I always uh, like to collaborate, and I never have enough time to do everything I want to do. So please reach out if you're interested in, in collaborating on some of them. So thank you for your attention. Uh, these are the papers relevant to our talk. Uh, this is in review right now. We're going to submit the second one soon. Uh, this is our air paper, and then some side works on Krylov and space-time air for advection diffusion.